Yeah, so I was tasked a 30-minute presentation and wrote an eight-hour book. Um, it was somewhat challenging. Um, and then since it's being videoed, I have to thank my wife for her patience, tolerance, and acceptance uh, with, with my process. Uh, I did something very stupid on Wednesday, and she came home, and I said, I rewrote the whole thing. She's just like, eye roll, like, oh, my God, what's wrong with this guy? Um, but anyway, so this is going to kind of be a three-parter, and um, really what we're going to cover is a clinical trial the design and the outcomes, right? So that's important. So we'll kind of set the, you know, the facts of what we found in our one-year results. Then we'll go through the components of the VERTA intervention. So really the pieces, right, that make it work, everything that does the continuous care model uh, on that side. We'll cover a little bit of nutritional ketosis. I think it's been covered in quite length. Um, I don't know that I could add anything new to the conversation that's either in the public or that we've provided. If you have ketosis questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, then we'll go into, you know, I called it health coaching with purpose. I figured I'd have about 15 minutes, and health coaching literally could be a three-day seminar. Um, so I thought I'd pick one thing I find to, as a practitioner, be the most meaningful to me personally, and I think also for a lot of people to be the most impactful, really connecting with purpose and meaning and the deep sense of why for doing this. And if you're not a practitioner, I think this really applies to anyone. So I coach high school kids, coach soccer and track. It works there. I have kids. I have family members that want to do th Anytime anyone wants to make a behavior change or improve their life, anytime we can connect back to a purpose or a deep sense of meaning and why we're doing something, I think that really sets us up to have the foundation to move forward. So, okay, so the trial. On a high level, let me just do this. There we go. So I kind of talk with my hands, so I kind of should have got a laser pointer, but... Um, on a high level, here's what we saw. And this is from two papers that we published this year. So 60% of completing patients reverse diabetes, right? So that would be A1C under 6.5% or glycemic control without the use of diabetes-specific medications, okay? On average, we had a 1.3% average reduction in HbA1c with 70% of the people below 6.5. So the 70 and the 60 are a little different. Some of the people are still on diabetes meds under 6.5, so we don't count that as, you know, full reversal yet in that. So that's why those stats are a little different. Uh, on medication, you know, really probably the most impactful, 94% of insulin users reduced or eliminated dosages, right, and a lot of times very quickly. Uh, I think we had 100% reduction in sulfonylurea use. Um, over 50% DPP-4s, over 50% SGLT-2s. Um, I cut that slide out just for time, and I thought maybe it's not as technical a conference, so it wouldn't be that interesting. But if you want the data, obviously I can point you to the papers um, and show those slides with you too. Weight loss. So we don't specifically market this as weight loss, right? It's diabetes reversal. But people do lose weight, and that is a goal, right? Sometimes it's the main goal, but it is a goal. So we saw a 12% average weight loss from start to day 365 across the population. And that would have been an average of 30 pounds per patient. So it does work for weight loss as well. And I'll show a chart graph there. The second paper we published was in cardiovascular diabetology, which is an interesting word. Um, so we saw cardiovascular risk improvement, including dyslipidemia, right, or cholesterol numbers being off. So 12% improvement in the 10-year ASCVD risk score. I do have a chart that's going to kind of outline all the risk markers and all the improvements that we saw there too. So it's not going to be a deep dive, but give you enough on that. Okay, so trial design. So this was done in conjunction with Indiana University Health System in uh, Lafayette, Indiana. So it's a five-year, non-randomized, perspective-controlled study. Uh, we recruited 465 participants through August 2015 and March of 2016. So we're coming up on the three-year mark next year. Okay, uh, The active arm, an N of 378. And we put these pictures of people up there, and this is something that, like, I fall into the trap of doing, is that I see an N number, and I don't really think that these are actual human beings, right? You know, it's just like, oh, the N of 10,000 or the N of 368, and, you know, really every one of those Ns is a human with a story, right? Somebody trying to do something, life was going on, things happened um, on that side. So I fall into that trap, so I would... You know, anytime we can kind of think when we see a study that had humans doing something and then humans caring for them, I think it just kind of gives a deeper underlying meaning to what it is. Um, 262 of our active arm were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. 
So we did have a percentage that were pre-diabetic. Okay, so A1C 5.7 up to the 6.5. The usual care arm, so that would be your standard of care. Um, we recruited 87 people who just continued whatever they were doing. So we do have a comparison group in that side. Mean age was 54. You know, these are averages. Obviously, there's not probably one specific person in this study that actually is all these averages, but they're meaningful for trials. So the mean age was 54, mean BMI of 40.3, weight, starting weight 257. The average years of diagnosis for type 2 diabetes was 8.4. So we didn't go out and cherry pick people who were newly diagnosed um, on that side. And then it was 67% female. All right, do patients stay engaged? So that seems to be an issue with uh, nutrition-related trials, <laughs> right? Can people actually do it? And uh, what we found was yes. So 83% trial retention at the end of one year. Um, obviously, people drop out for many reasons. Could be health reasons. This is, a, this is a large commitment that they're making, right? It's not just behavior change. You know, they had to go to appointments and labs and see the physician. And so it was, it was a pretty large time commitment. So 83% of people were willing to stay engaged and continue through year one. Uh, we are going to publish future papers. That's a huge priority for us. Right? It's a five-year trial. We're not going to end here. Uh, I can't give you the list off hand from memory, but it's at least like 10 more papers that are coming out the gate here, hopefully pretty soon. All right, HBAC. So again, we had a 1.3% average reduction, 60% diabetes reversal. So the average starting was 7.5%. We have this number here at 70 days because we did publish a 70-day paper to kind of get something out. Um, so even at 70 days, the average got below 6.5. Then it comes down to 6.2 out of one year. And then the gray line at the top goes up, actually, and that would be our usual care arm. So the people that just kept doing whatever they were doing and didn't make any changes, it got a little worse. Not bad, but a little worse. Okay, here's the weight change graph, so obviously start at zero. We get down to our 12% here. The dashed line is 5%, and so that's what's considered statistically significant in a nutrition weight loss trial, okay? So anytime anyone does any intervention and gets better than 5%, that's considered excellent. So we got 12. 86% uh, of patients lost more than 5%, and 61% of patients actually lost more than 10%. And I don't have exact numbers, but we did have multiple patients lose over 50 and even 100 pounds individually, right? Okay, from the cardiovascular paper, so examining all cardiovascular risk biomarkers that are generally accepted as cardiovascular risk biomarkers, we saw improvement of 22 of 26 of them in the treatment, right? So that's one of the main kind of criticisms of low carb or ketosis is, yeah, you can reverse diabetes, but you're going to give them all heart disease, right? And so we're showing that is not the, not the case. If you look at our usual care arm, zero improvement in any risk biomarker. So whatever biomarker risk or biomarker that you think is the mo most important for risk or your physician does, or your practitioner or philosophy does, zero of them improved in the usual care. All right, so what do we actually do? So this will be more of the tactical X's and O's, nuts and bolts. Okay, so we have two sources of innovation. So we have continuous remote care, and that's going to be enabled through the technology. So I have a phone in my bag. I can watch someone's glucose numbers, ketone numbers, and I can get messages from them pretty much 24-7. I do sleep, right, but the system's watching them on the backside. The physician does the same thing. So what we call it telemedicine platform in your pocket, right? It's personalized physician and coach care, all right? obviously different than the traditional medical mark, right? Somebody goes into their doctor, make a change, come back and maybe see us in a month. It's a large gap in care there. So really we're using the technology to close that gap. And then we have our clinical protocol. So this would be medication management, right? A lot of people are coming in on medications. They need to be monitored. They need to be adjusted. And then we have individual guidance, including nutritional ketosis. Um, and I'll get into more. We do provide guidance on other things besides just ketosis. Okay, so here's how it looks. So we have Wilma in the center. Uh, just, she's fantastic. She's in some of our videos. I haven't got to meet her personally, but her personality is uh, just super, super engaging. And, you know, I love watching all her videos. So we have a biomarker tracking on the left, right? So the patient gets an app. We're going to send them a meter. You know, they're going to test their blood glucose. They're going to test their ketones. We send them a 
um, cell phone connected scale. So they stand on it and it automatically imports to the app, right? That's pretty cool. Um, if someone's on hypertensive medication, we'll send them a blood pressure cuff. We want to monitor that as well, okay? That all in real time from the dotted line at the top goes to the health coach. So I can see all that. Right? I can see somebody's fasting glucose. I can see their post-meal glucose. I can see their ketones. I can see their weight this morning. I can see it all in real time. And then they get nice charts and graphs, and we get nice charts and graphs so we can see trends, right? Especially when it comes to weight, trend, longer-term trends are more important, right? Like, I, I remember my experience doing this, and every employee can, can do it. Uh, like, I gained two pounds today. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's like, okay, it's not the end of the world. Um, so long-term trends there. So the health coach, then we can communicate. So there's the, the chat stream, the message. Um, we do also do phone calls and video calls, right? It's not all technology. You know, there's certain things that 500 text messages aren't going to do, right? But a 15-minute or a 30-minute phone call or a video call can be very impactful, right? Information, um, hey, coach, what do you think about this recipe? Text, great. Hey, I lost my job today. That's a phone call. Uh, yeah, so uh, on the back end of the loop, we have health coach and physician communication, obviously vitally important, you know, for, you know, just caring for people on that side. The physicians do communicate with the patients, right? So they do, um, uh, I don't know if there's a routine cadence for video calls, but there are video calls. So in the process, when someone comes in, they're going to do a video kind of like history and physical and get to meet the physician and talk about everything they need so the physician has the background. Physician's going to monitor glucose and progress and make med changes, you know, just like I monitor glucose on that side. And then at certain milestones or certain points during the process, the, phys the patient is going to do calls with the physician from the physician's request. And every once in a while, there are reasons, that, you know, good reasons that a physician needs to talk to their physician, right? It's like going to see your regular doctor. So we want to make that available. And then down here, something we probably haven't talked a lot about, um, patient community. So this is actually why I started at Verda. Um, so the clinical trial was going on, and the idea was we need a way for patients to interact with each other, right? I came out of addiction recovery, so kind of well-stepped in a 12-step model, and you know, really tried, didn't use 12 steps, but really tried to model it off the philosophy of sharing experience, strength, and hope, right? When we get in a room with other people, that have suffered through the same thing that we've suffered with. We have some kind of connection and affinity, right, with them already. Friendships, fellowship, those things build. So we wanted to provide a place where people could interact with each other, right, and share, hey, awesome things that happen, right, and then also not so awesome things that happen, right, and have it be a safe place where they could, you know, not be judged and be understood and share those things and get validation and also hear other people's stories and realize, I'm not the only one, right? You know, health issues can be very socially isolating, right, on that side. So I came into Verda, started that up, moderated it for a couple of years, and it was a really rewarding experience, you know, just seeing the friendships that developed um, online. And then my judge of a really successful community is that people actually started meeting in real life on their own. Hey, we're going to do a meetup in Portland. Hey, let's get together for a lunch once a week in Indiana. Who likes to ride bikes? Who wants to do a walking club? All those kind of things, right? So social media is kind of bridging that connection back into the real world, you know, where we see kind of it's divisive on one end. Here's a positive side of it on another. And then we do have a resource center, right? Self-education is big. Um, sometimes people don't want to ask the coach, right? It might be 1 a.m. Well, hopefully they're sleeping. But it might be 1 a.m. and you're like really wanting a recipe. <laughs> so I'm not going to be able to answer you. So Resource Center, we have more articles on different topics. Um, you know, it's pretty comprehensive, but then we also, I think the biggest thing is recipes. Um, but that's all in there. Anything they want to know, continuously building on that. It's just a place they can go 24-7 on demand to get what they need um, without any assistance on that side. So the feedback loop, so biomarkers, so here's what we're tracking. So we have ketones uh, via blood, so beta-hydroxybutyrate. We use the precision extra meter. Um, I think we've been testing out the keto mojo maybe, but uh, we're going to track blood glucose, obviously, weight, mood. Uh, here's what we do on our, so that's quantitative, and then qualitatively, 
mood and energy, hunger and cravings. So there's a one to, scale, one to four sliding scale a patient can check in with, right? So again, we're looking at trends, right? Oh, your mood's been excellent, four, 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 now it's one. Well, your numbers might be good, but that tells me something as a coach. Something's going on with this person I need to reach out. Same for energy, right? Hunger, cravings, those are all important, kind of qualitative. Probably the question that I ask most often is, how do you feel? How do you feel? I know what the numbers are. I don't know why the numbers are that way. I need context. How do you feel? Okay. Do you feel okay? Great. If the numbers are great and you feel great, you're doing great. If the numbers are great and you feel bad, something's going on. Maybe that's an early sign. Okay. The numbers are bad and you feel great. That's kind of odd. Uh, and the numbers are bad and you feel bad. All right. Well, that's, that's a pretty good sign there. Um, yeah. So why, how do you feel? Very, very important. So health coaches, so what do we do? You know, kind of on a high level, we focus on nutrition and behavior change. So we have a multidisciplinary team. Um, we wanted to make a wide range of practitioners. And so we have registered dietitians, nurses, clinical psychologists, people of varied backgrounds, education levels. Some of them have PhDs, masters, those kind of things. Kind of goes in two phases, and these, these overlap a little bit. So in the early months, you know, we're kind of in the reversal phase, right? So we could take um, someone that comes in with very limited nutrition knowledge, right? What do they need at the beginning? They need to know what to do, right? So they need the plan. They need the information. They need the education. The system's going to walk them through a set of educational videos, right? So they're going to do some things on their own. We've got some little quizzes in there, um, you know, just to kind of assess how they're doing in the learning process. The coach is going to be there to answer questions, help them plan, figure out what foods they like, what foods they don't like, you know, really kind of set that structure or scaffolding that they can begin to work in. The, the coach at the beginning is also going to work on behavior change. It's not just long term, right? We have short term behavior change. You know, how do we plan our day? How do we grocery shop? Right? What time do we get up? We might be make we might be cooking more food, right? Okay, we need to allot time for that. Maybe we need to adjust some priorities. All those kind of things happen. So. Nutritional guidance. Then on the medication side, that's going to be coming from the physician. Um, so like you saw with weight loss and the A1C drop, if we take somebody on low carbon ketosis and they're doing fairly well, they can have very rapid lowering in blood glucose, right? So we need to be really on reducing those medications and the physicians are on top of it and the coaches are communicating with them back and forth on that side. And then troubleshooting, it's kind of a catch-all. I mean, it really could be anything, right? Um, in the later months, so say we have somebody's getting it and they're doing fairly well. They've got a routine down. They've got the basics. They're seeing some success. So we kind of shift to long-term behavior change and then navigating life events, right? There might be a life event that happens a weekend, right? Trauma, tragedy, stress, job loss. I mean, we can't really predict those things. Um, but when we get out in the longer stage with behavior change and life events, probably the, I mean, the recurring one in the long term where we like people to stay at least a year as you get through every holiday, <laughs> like, those are probably the most stressful planned events or things that we know are going to come up on the calendar. And it's like, if you can get a year through and we can get you through a Thanksgiving and a Christmas and an Easter and some birthday parties and birthday cake and you know, all those kind of things, um, and you've got some assistance and support that can be very helpful on that side. Uh, the later months, and again, we also work with this in the earlier months because this is always important at every phase. We do give personalized guidance on exercise, sleep, stress management, and also support in, you know, just dealing with body image and those kind of things. So I got into ketosis because I was overweight. Um, I've lost 60 pounds doing it, elevated A1C, and there were definitely times um, that's five years ago, but there are definitely times in the weight loss process where I looked in the mirror and saw my old self, right? I was just really connected with this old image of myself and that self-esteem level that I had then would come back, right? Guilt, shame, self-hate's probably strong, but it's probably a good self-description at times, right? Um, so we help people kind of navigate that and really just hold space. Right? And then, you know, let them kind of work through those things and, you know, really provide validation and reassurance and emotional support. So that's a really big part of what coaches do. Uh, it's not just all the technical X's and O's and meal planning, all those things. It's really being there for someone as another human being caring for them. Um, when we look at B12, 
Behavioral change techniques, so these are official words. So we have cognitive behavioral therapy, right, which can kind of be summed up with, why are you doing what you're doing? Uh, <laughs> let's be aware of that. Smart goals, so measurable, actionable, timely, all those kind of things. And then motivational interviewing, which I like to sum up with as a long series of asking people why over and over again. Um, and I'll get kind of more into motivational interviewing because that's really the one I like the most. And that's going to be now. Um, so usually at this point in a presentation, I'm completely zoned out from staring at PowerPoints and not listening to the person anymore. So I figured I'd at least put something up there you would like to stare at and zone out to if you're not paying attention. So, and that's okay if you're not. Um, so really, this is going to be more on purpose, and I did kind of draft some stuff, so I'll take my notes out so that I don't kind of lose my, my train of thought here on this. I'm more of a writer than a presenter. I had this like extreme freak out moment when they offered for me to do this. Um, I think neuroscience would describe that as an overactive amygdala, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's fine. I'll just throw this up here. So I've got my little support slides. Um, so this is going to be a little more philosophical, and when I could talk about health coaching, literally it could be three days. So I think I'd pick the, if I could pick the one thing that's the most meaningful to me, and I pointed on that at the beginning, it's really kind of like purpose and meaning and finding our deep why. So for me as a coach, it was really a, a formal exercise that was suggested to me to do this in my practice. So if you're a practitioner or a care provider, or really you care about people, I think it's really worth going through this process of outlining what our purpose and meaning and why it is we do what we do. And I think we generally have an idea um, in our head, we wanna help people, right? But I think going through this process and really outlining it can be very powerful. Um, I heard this podcast, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Jocko Willink, kind of Navy SEAL guy, it's pretty good. So podcast one, two, three, he had on Marine Corporal Jake Schick and I had a real affinity for him, he had, um, PTSD, addiction issues, trauma, loss, all those kind of things. And I struggled with a lot of those things. And he's, he said this thing, and it's not really new to me or probably new to any of us. Very simple. He said, we're here for two reasons, to love and be loved. Everything else is filler, right? And um, our family, we had recently gone through a tragedy. My wife lost her oldest son uh, on May 2nd, which kind of made this trip a, a little challenging. But... Um, I heard that sitting out in our yard like two weeks after that. Yeah, kind of Jocko's podcast is pretty heavy, and I'm like, you know, I, I was searching for something, so, you know, some meaning, something to grasp, but that glimmer of hope right in the moment of tragedy. And Corporal Schick goes through his story, and it's very traumatic, but here he is on the other side saying we're here for two reasons, to love and be loved. And so that really, I think, is really it kind of changed what I wanted to talk about today, actually. I'm like, if I'm going to fly to Montana in the midst of all this family stuff and be away, then I actually want to say something that's meaningful that you guys might get something out of. I mean, I can read slides, but I mean, I don't know. It's like I got a mic. I might as well use it. Um, so it kind of reconnected me with my purpose, right? And so my purpose is being of service to others with no expectations, okay? Pretty simple. I also use that as my definition of love. So when I look at my wife or my kids or anyone in the room or patients, you know, be of service with no expectations, right? It is an extremely difficult practice, <laughs> especially with children. Uh, you know, and I, I admittedly don't, don't do that well, but I think it's worth the effort and having that as a foundation for life. So I think of it as kind of a philosophy of life and a purpose and a meaning that, un that I underlies everything I do and I don't always succeed. Right, but I build off that foundation from the bottom to the top. Uh, if that resonates with you, you can obviously take it. I didn't invent it. It's not an original thought. I don't think I've had an original thought I can claim. Um, if you're not feeling that, that's awesome too. Uh, really the exercise is to sit down with pen and paper and outline a purpose statement for why we do what we do. Right? And if you get deep enough to one that undergirds everything in life, I think you found something really solid there. Um, Here's how I got there, right? So I had a sponsor in recovery, pretty wise guy. I picked a guy who was very successful, materially successful. I'm like, I want what he has. And then he gave me something I didn't know I wanted. Um, he just sat down and he suggested 
we don't give advice, we make suggestions. Um, he's like, yeah, you might want to sit down and write a purpose statement, really kind of think about it. And that was really the spark that kind of kicked off this journey. At the same time, you know, things kind of intertwine. I was studying Buddhism and training in meditation. We have a local monastery in St. Louis, right? Um, and I came across four qualities of love in Buddhism. They're called the four immeasurable minds. And they're basically loving kindness, which is really the desire to offer happiness to others, compassion, joy, and then equanimity, which is really the desire to accept everything, right? No expectations. Everyone comes as they come. We accept them how they are, for how they've been, what they're doing today, and how they will be, right? No judgment. So why did I decide to talk about this today? Well, others have been having this conversation. Right? I think the more in coaching and health and wellness and medicine, the conversation as a whole, the collective we is going less from the prescriptive and the technical, right? To how do we actually help people do this? I have one patient who cares about the biochemistry of ketosis. One. It's fun to geek out with him. No one else cares, right? They want to know how their life's going to get better. Right? We still have to be competent in the technical aspects of coaching, right? the X's and O's. We have to know what we're doing. Right? We can't just run out with blind compassion and not know anything. Right? <laughs> it's like, that's not going to work. Um, and I look at that, and really what attracted me to Finney and Volek's work, I look at that as the art and science of coaching. Right? They have the art and science of low-carb living and the art and science of low-carb performance. This is really the art and science of coaching and the art and science of living. Right? We have to have competence and we have to, have to care. The most meaningful thing, and maybe that's a strong statement, but the thing I get maybe get the most pleasure out of working with a patient is helping them walk through this process of finding their purpose and meaning, developing a philosophy of life and their why. A lot of times it's super easy, right? Yeah, people run in, that I love my family, I love my work, I love my community, I volunteer. They have it figured out. Generally, they do really well with behavior change, right? They have something else to go to. Um, it's usually when we don't have a real connection with that sense that things get off kilter. Patients come in motivated generally by fear and pain and suffering. And there's a very strong motivation. But it's temporary, okay? Especially when they get better, right? And that's a very common thing. We come in, we're super motivated, we can do anything for one, two, three months, right? The pain and suffering is so intense, and this is the same thing that happens in addiction. And they call it the pink cloud phase. Rapid change, everything's excellent, life is great, there's never a problem. We hit our goals. This is the new normal. We stop doing what we were doing. Complacency sets in, right? And then we go off track a little bit, right? And so this is when I jump in as a coach and see it as invaluable information. I know what I should be doing, and I'm not doing it. Okay, let's reconnect with your purpose. And when I do a video call, I see the eyes light up, and then I know I've got something. And if I'm on a phone call, the tone changes. People like talking about their purpose and meaning. They want to connect with it. They don't want another meal plan. They don't want to hear a biochemistry lecture, right? They want to be talked to as a person and really connect to and find a deep meaning in life. So it kind of looks like this. So we set a purpose. Purpose for living, purpose for doing anything we're doing. We set standards, right? No expectations and also no rules. I coach high school kids. They like to break rules. Adults like to break rules too, okay? So we set standards. Standards are positive. They're affirmative. They're something to aim for. I've never heard someone say, I want to break standards ever, right? We want to meet standards, okay? And on top, we set goals. Goals change. Sometimes we meet goals. Sometimes goals are unrealistic. Goals are not a stable place to put ourselves. They need to be on the top. And when you look in the technical side of the standards, yes, yeah, some of those standards with behavior are going to be related to goals. So maybe I could have made this like a nice circle, but I tried to make this design myself like two days ago and realized I have third grade capability in paint. And so I kind of rushed and got it to our tech guys and they gave me this nice, wonderful design. So I will continue to, to work on it and maybe evolve it some more. So if you leave with one thing, Purpose, standards, goals, right? We have to have a purpose for doing what we're doing. And, oh, last slide. More information. So there's our website. 
We have a Twitter account. I have a Twitter account. I read tweets. I every once in a while post a tweet. I write a lot of tweets that I then delete and don't post. Uh, usually arguments I don't need to involve myself in about nutrition. Um, there's my email address. We are hiring. <laughs> Maybe that's the takeaway message. Read your tweet twice before you post it. Uh, <laughs> it's like uh, uh, job opportunities. Here's the actual links to the papers on that side. Um, and if you do have any questions really about anything with Verta, feel free to, to reach out to me while I'm here or afterwards. I mean, I think one of the reasons we come to this thing is to connect with people, right? I mean, obviously it's going to be videotaped and all those kind of things, you know, but we all made an effort to come here to meet real people, and I like people still, so. Um, and then Krista's here. She's in the back. She actually is volunteering here as well. She works for Verda, so she'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys have, too, so if you want to catch her if I'm not around. Um, yeah, let's Q&A. Q&A. Okay, thank you very much. So, big hand. Um, we have a microphone over there on the right. If people want to ask questions, please line up and use the mic since um, the questions are being videotaped. Naomi. Thank you, Linda. Doug, thank you so much for coming, especially mm -hmm. given what you've told us about what a challenge it was to be here. So, mm -hmm. um, These data are astonishing, mm -hmm. and so... The obvious question is, how does it get scaled? And I'm curious about what kinds of conversations you're having at Verda about how to have a larger impact. And it also strikes me, listening to you, that you're clearly an extraordinary coach. H how do we get these results on a much larger scale? Are you guys talking to insurance companies? Are you talking to the Buffett, Bezos, you know, three employer effort? Uh, how, how do we scale it? So I, um, honestly, I, I'm not in the room for those conversations. But what from I don't, I mean I don't know if Sami knows Bezos or not. But maybe we're talking to them. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, uh, on enterprise level, we do work with corporations, right? Um, we're offered as a benefit basically through the HR packages, and that's that's a really good strategy for growth, right? Employers are bearing a huge cost of medical care for their employees, and then we could throw on. Um, you know, absenteeism, lowered performance, right? If we don't have a healthy employee, how impactful are they being on our business, right? Um, so it's not just the ROI and the expense on the corporate side. And I'm not anti-capitalist or corporate. I mean, I have, I have a tendency to believe in the good in people, and I think most corporations do care about their people. Um, obviously, that's not across the board, but I like to come in with a positive aspect about everyone until I have evidence it's different um, on that. So I generally think companies care about their people, even if it is just, you know, sometimes it does help the ROI, and that's a, that's a big point. Um, so that's a big growth strategy. Uh, I believe we are talking to insurers. I think that would really open up that. I think that's one problem with the current system is it's trapped by insurance, realistically. And also the general public, we're just not used to paying for medical care. Right, and that is changing. Um, you know, so the people that come and pay cash out of pocket, they see the value, right? And maybe they also have the financial ability to make that though, right? And I think we really want to democratize health through the technology, right? We don't want this to be for the 1%, right? We want this to be for everyone on that side. Um, does that kind of cover all of all the bases? Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, very impressive results that you got. And I think one of the key elements was the continuous coaching model. You're not sort of sporadic, but you're always there on top of it. So you never let things go astray. So I have two questions about it, this study, though. Um, I assume I'd like to know a little bit more how you recruited the patients. Was it voluntary? Were they selected? Did they come running to a site? And how would this work in just a general population where you didn't have that voluntary sign up. The other is, could you go beyond diabetics? Could you, because the benefits here could apply more widely to cardiovascular benefits and, and all the other benefits of ketosis. So those two questions are voluntary recruitment or, you know, and then could you scale it to other conditions? Yeah, so on the recruiting that, um, I wasn't around at the beginning of the recruiting, but I know the stories and that was a huge amount of work by our 
by our team to recruit. I didn't realize the amount of work that went into trying to get people to sign up for a trial. Uh, it was voluntary. I mean, mailers, you know, you go into your doctor's office and there's a little TV screen. We'd have little ads up. I think they even ran thing, ran actual TV or radio commercials. Right. But, but those are motivated people then, right? So Correct. how would this yeah. apply to a group of people who weren't as motivated? So you, you have to be kind of motivated to get through the process to become a patient. Um, we're trying to make that easier, but there is a level of commitment, right? We do require, you know, we are practicing medicine. Our physicians are practicing medicine. So if you go to a new doctor, there's a level of effort just to go see a new doctor, right? You're gonna have to fill out the forms and you gotta go and there's a level of commitment. So we have the same thing here. You know, the process is really gonna be, they can sign up on the website, you know, anybody can sign up on the website, but then you're gonna do a call with an intake specialist who's gonna explain the program, right? Make sure it's right for you on that side. And then you got some forms to fill out and we do ask people to get, you know, blood work done so we can baseline them if they haven't had updated labs, right? We wanna track their progress. There's multiple steps in the process to becoming a patient that if you're really just not that motivated and kicking the tires, I don't think they're gonna make it through. Um, I and, would then, and then how about expanding beyond diabetes? Yeah, um, so our corporate line is safely and sustainably reverse type two diabetes and other chronic metabolic diseases, right? And I think, I saw your talk, and I think we all generally know that this works for some other things. Um, we want to be evidence-based. So if sometimes maybe we get a little criticism for being a little slow into jumping into other things, one, we want to make sure that we build the structure correctly to do this first, right? Um, if we do this correctly, then doing those, just we've got the model, we've got the setup, right? Um, but we're, we're definitely interested in those things. And some of it's going to be dependent on research that other groups do, right? We could all speculate about what ketosis cures, but we are practicing medicine. Um, so we want more evidence on some of those things. But when it comes out, I think we'll definitely be looking at those. Yeah. Hey, good morning. My name is Christoph. I'm from South Africa. Um, and um, I'm also a health coach. And I wanted to know, thank you, firstly, um, for the very, very nice um, insights and, um, and sharing your purpose. Um, but I wanted to know how best to onboard some potential doctors, um, physicians. Um, they might be referred to um, very often by their patients. Mm -hmm. Very often the patients say, my doctor is not supporting this, and is there any um, onboarding procedure or any resources um, you have to share to get those doctors on board as well? Okay, so we have a couple things. So w we only accept patients in the United States, but we do have physician outreach. Okay, so f if you have a physician or you are a physician, there is a page on the website they can go fill out. Um, they kind of get on a mailing list, but that would give them the opportunity in some cases to speak with some of our doctors, right on that side. If a doctor has a patient in our clinic, obviously our physician is talking with someone's primary care, right? We wanna have an open line of communication. I think that's the right thing to do for the patient. Nothing more frustrating than when someone has four specialists and they don't communicate. I mean, it just drives people nuts. I mean, it's, it's just not the right thing to do for people on that side. Um, so, you know, we want their primary care to know what they're doing on that side. We do have a Facebook group for practitioners. Um, nutritional I'll ketosis for physicians and providers sponsored by Verta Health. <laughs> I wrote that in the paper and I didn't say it because I didn't read it because I didn't want to read it. But um, yeah, so we have over 800 people and um, happy anybody that wants to join. It's an open group on that side. So 